I'd like to just announce a uh, change to the uh, running order of the program this morning. Uh, George Mentz, who is here in front of me, and George has experienced his own multiple border crossings in the last 72 hours because George has um, been on a plane from Norfolk, Virginia, and we're very happy that he's arrived safely and has braved Australian customs and border force and has entered in one piece. However, George is also um, fairly exhausted from his flight and has not slept a great deal. So um, he did, of course, keep us in, informed about this uh, as he made each slow step towards Melbourne. Um, so we're very happy he's here. George, we will be hearing his keynote tomorrow at lunchtime so we can have lunch here in the room. We can eat lunch in the room and hear from George at the same time, which sounds like a, a very good two for one deal for me. So what we've done is we've moved um, another speaker into George's slot right now, and that is Nina Markovic, who is who you're going to hear from in a moment. And I'll just introduce uh, Nina and her paper, um, just to give you an outline of what Nina's done. And for those of you who are members of um, the European Studies Association of Australia and New Zealand, you will have known, and CESA before that, you'll have known Nina for many, many years, or maybe you met her in Canberra when she worked in Parliament House. Um, I don't know where you were working when I met you, but that was, yeah, 2013, whatever, whatever that was. Um, but Nina holds a PhD in political science with a specialisation on EU foreign and security policy. She's currently working as a lecturer in international relations at Macquarie University, Sydney, and director of research and communications at Solve Law. Previously, as I mentioned, she was a parliamentary public servant for the federal parliament in Canberra, working as a senior researcher, Europe and Middle East at the Parliamentary Research Service. I know this because my students cite her all the time, particularly on the Russian war with Georgia. Uh, today, uh, Nina will be speaking about the Balkans as a source of labor migration for Europe and migration trends from the Balkans to the EU and UK before and during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'd like to welcome Nina up here and uh, we'll have about 15 minutes. Well, thank you very much, Remy, for a very kind introduction, and um, thanks to Fedja as well for being the opening part of this conference. Uh, my name is not George, uh, but um, I will try my best to provide some useful remarks um, using the Balkans as a case study. Now, I have multiple hats. I'm also a journalist, so whatever you say, I might write about it and publish it, and I do get published as well. Um, so um, as a director of communications at Solve Law, I also do a lot of cases um, to do with protection visas. At the moment, I'm working on Ukrainian protection visas. At Macquarie, I'm a sessional um, lecturer and demonstrator in diplomacy and practice. So my students love that. And previously um, at the Australian Parliamentary uh, Research Service, I was covering wider Europe, including Russia, the Middle East and the UN. Um, the only person who was um, covering Europe. And after I resigned to finish my PhD, they cut Europe. So there is no more Europe specialty at the Australian Parliamentary Research Service. I will briefly mention what will I not say. Um, I will not um, cover digital migration and digital integration. Now, this is a specialized area of research and a growing actually area of, of interest to the European Commission and a lot of funding is being directed into this area. It does require a standalone focus. And before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the land of the Wurundjeri, Woi Wurung and Wurung Boon Wurung peoples of the Eastern Kulin and their elders past, present and emerging. They are the traditional owners of this land which was never ceded and a part of the oldest continuous culture in the world. I would also like to acknowledge all of Australia's um, leaders who are um, the present and the future of this country. I often tell my students to use mind maps. Um, Tony Buzan would be quite happy that I'm always emphasizing, but mind maps are a useful way of generating ideas and making connections with key concepts. For this particular presentation, I chose to cover um, a little bit um, illegal and legal migration issues to the EU through and from the Western Balkans, 
um, covering issues uh, dealing with spaces of insecurity, inclusion, and exclusion. Now, last year for the East Ends annual conference, we had a very talented um, filmmaker who was uh, from Macquarie University. His name is Peter Bojevic, and he uh, he made a very um, powerful award-winning documentary called Roots. And this movie, uh, which was released last year in 2021, actually humanizes the face of migration, uh, illegal migration or irregular migration through Europe and through the Balkan route in particular. So whoever has a chance, this is a very good Australian um, contribution to this particular topic, which is quite rare to see. The Western Balkans is imaginary um, a distant place. However, having more than 400,000 migrants in Australia of um, Western Balkans origin highlights the interest and the growing interest in, in terms of academic work um, in this part of the world. So this is my mind map, not very colorful. Um, so my students will probably complain. But um, I build on the work of uh, Anna Krasteva, who is really um, one of the most prominent experts in this field. From her work, um, I have um, employed some of the ideas uh, regarding conceptualization of irregular migration and illegal migration. And she distinguishes between the policy and politics. And the politics is that part when we talk about populism and the framing of migration as a security threat. In terms of policies, policies are there to regulate and respond to black swan events, such as um, the 2015 Syrian um, escalation of uh, migration crisis. And the Balkan route was one of the main uh, routes um, of the migrants to Western Europe. Actually, more than one million migrants from Iraq and Syria actually transverse through this region, which is dealing with its own issues such as uh, post-conflict reconstruction and deep sense of insecurity, which still persists for many. Western Balkans actually um, was the first um, migration wave um, destination or origin um, after the Second World War in the 1990s. The displacement of more than 2 million people from the region, half of Bosnia's pre-war population, was such a shock and a major, again, black swan event for Western Europe and other countries later on. But Western Europe really bore the brunt of that massive migration wave. In 2015, we had another major black swan event with millions of Syrians and Iraqis transversing through that route, but it was only one of many routes. Countries in the Western Balkans responded differently, but what Anna Krasteva's work highlights is very interesting for us as researchers. The conceptualization in countries such as Serbia was very different during the migration wave as compared to five years later. Initially, um, Serbia was very welcoming and it was um, a country hailed by the European Commission for the most humane approach to refugees. However, five years later, coinciding with the pandemic, you had the rise of um, right-wing groups, often with very strong transnational uh, connections. Um, and I actually quotes one of the authors who said that um, Serbia has become um, a conference point for right-wing political groups from the UK, the US and other parts of the world. And the public mood shifted towards becoming more populist oriented. Now this was five years after the actual migration wave. Um, this stands in stark contrast to Hungary and Viktor Orban had um, a very populist attitudes right from the start. Um, highlighting that this migration wave is a threat to Hungarian national identity. And um, very soon we had the border being erected, um, quite a few actually fences in this part of the world. So the securitization of borders in sub-regional context is part of this narrative um, and the populist narrative, which was built over time. And this is quite interesting for the case study of Serbia in particular, but also um, other countries such as Bosnia. Sovereignty issues, of course, are the crux of the problem. But this region, we are talking about potential candidates for EU membership, actual candidates, and EU members. So very complex legal environment for dealing with irregular and regular migration. Um, for example, Bosnia only managed to secure funding um, two years ago to, to construct proper camps 
for migrants. One of them, which was completely burned down, left migrants um, without any support in the middle of winter. And, and whoever was watching Winter Olympics in, in Sarajevo about 30 years ago knows that winters can be very, very harsh, up to minus 25. Um, so this has highlighted the need for the EU, actually, and other international actors to provide more practical assistance on the ground. It is nice and fine talking about assistance on, on a grand scale, but when it comes to actual support that migrants receive on the ground, it is very patchy and it's severely underfunded. Over 5,000 people a day were often um, transferring to this area, again, through a post-conflict reconstruction zone. Not a very easy um, place to be. On the other hand, we are having serious security issues such as human trafficking. One of my friends was a Dari um, and Farsi specialist, and he was the first point of contact of interview uh, when migrants would come um, to the Croatian uh, border. And he witnessed many, many cases of human trafficking, separation of families, theft of babies just to be able to cross the border because some, at, on some days uh, only families were allowed to cross. So babies being kidnapped and dumped in the forest. Thankfully, um, the police would find them often. But absolute horrendous human rights abuses within this space of human trafficking on the borders. And this really requires further and in-depth research because it often is um, goes un, um, under-researched and under-reported. On the other hand, there were also, um, he was often um, called by various security agencies to translate um, because of the terrorism fear. So the terrorism aspect of, of um, this 2015 migration wave um, should also not be understated. And it is very difficult uh, to detect potential um, sympathizers or, or um, of terrorism um, in, a, in an area of, of a grand migration um, situation as we had. Transnational organized crime networks like everywhere make a lot of profit out of, um, of um, their services uh, and exploitation of um, irregular migrants and the economic cost of that is also um, huge. On the other hand, we have um, had an interesting shift in the last sort of four to five years and a paradigm shift in the Western Balkans. Traditionally, migration was seen as a national loss, as a loss of talent, as a brain drain. Um, the youth going overseas um, was not actually seen in favorable terms. However, with the, with the assistance of Italy and Germany in particular, there have been programs implemented across the Balkans, and I will use the case study of Albania and, and Serbia, um, that have tried to shift the narrative towards a positive narrative of having brain gain and the so-called brain sharing um, of, um, of expertise. We also have temporary and seasonal worker schemes, and these can be sometimes um, exploited, such as in the case of Malta. And we have my dear friend, the former deputy high commissioner of Malta in the audience here. Um, it is fascinating that in Malta in 2017, 20% of all first-time residence permits were issued to Serbians and the Filipinos. Um, and actually 10% of the Maltese population has um, some sort of residency permits, whether it's, temp it's mostly temporary, but some managed to transfer that to a more permanent status. Malta has 500,000 people. 10% of 50,000 is quite a large number for a small country like Malta. And this is causing a lot of uh, questions of uh, workers' rights and uh, migrant rights and also responsibilities of the state. And Malta, I would argue, is a very interesting case study in this case. Um, economic migrants uh, contribute a lot to their home countries. Uh, they are the major source of, of different types of remittances. And often um, this is difficult to quantify because um, that many transfers are often done through Western Union or um, non sort of um, quantifiable means. Um, governments can't really capture the volume, but they're very um, much encouraging that inward flow of finances from the West. And we also have education related migration, but for the Western Balkan space, this is really not used enough. Um, the regional education exchange is something that has been trialed and promoted by the European Commission. But because of the enormous costs of, uh, of living in the West, it is very difficult for, for students from this region unless they have a, um, some sort of funding to go abroad or family, uncle in America, which would support that. Um, 
at the same time, a lot of um, issues between the European Commission and Western Balkans countries, especially before 2015, were in that space of seeking asylum and refugee protection. Albania, in particular, was uh, one of top five countries of asylum um, seeking origin in the EU before 2015. This is the camp in Bosnia, which was recently constructed after um, the previous one was burned down. So there are many, many challenges of um, policy um, implementation in the field of irregular and regular migration in this part of the world. This is just to show you the magnitude of, um, of the, the route really from Syria and Iraq um, to Western Europe. Um, I, I would probably describe transversing to Western Balkans probably as a barbed wire. You don't know which part will cut you and which won't. There were many stories of um, irregular migrants being completely stripped of all their belongings, especially in the Bulgarian space, um, their possessions stolen and literally just sort of pushed across the border. So there were many stories of illegal pushbacks and exploitation and absolute abuse of migrants. And we are talking about those numbers, more than 2 million people. This really needs to be um, reported more and written about. In terms of, um, so we are looking at those that left part of the mind map. Um, as I mentioned before, Kosovo and Albania were amongst the top five um, country, places of origin really, um, but there was Serbia as well in that list um, collectively in the EU, and this has caused a lot of issues with the EU, um, forcing the EU to find a different way of addressing this problem through so-called readmission or repatriation agreements. And we're talking about 2005, 2006, and 2007. Now, what has happened during the latest crisis is when migrants transversing this part of the world through Syria, from Syria and Iraq register in a country like Serbia, the repatriation agreement also could mean repatriating these migrants to Serbia because this was the first place where they got registered. In my opinion, this is also part of the reason why the mood has shifted from being pro-assistance um, to more becoming more populist because capacities in, in the countries in the Balkans are very limited and there is no permanent solution or any really medium term solution to this problem. So this is actually complicated the situation which we have now. And um, this uh, one of the agreements, for example, says that the member states should also readmit any third country national who holds a visa residence permit issued by that member state or who has entered illegally or directly into the partner country, such as country in the Western Balkans, after staying in or transiting through that member state. So quite a big conflict situation. So these repatriation agreements are not new. As I said, they date uh, from 2005 in, in the sense of um, coming into force. However, with Albania, um, the EU um, initiated the process um, on this front in 2002. So for a very long time, um, this was quite controversial. What I found quite interesting is this new movement to classify migration as a positive brain gain by countries in the Western Balkans. Italy for Albania has been the major source of um, workers um, destination for since 1990s, uh, whereas for other countries, um, these were Austria, Switzerland, Germany, within Europe. There are very different strategies now targeting diaspora. Diaspora in the West especially has been living quite a separate life from those mainland countries. The countries which experienced communism, for example, had a lot of problems with diaspora, such as in Australia. There was an even attempt to assassinate a Yugoslav leader when he came here um, on, on an official visit. The first Australia sort of bombing incident in Sydney was done again against the Yugoslav mission. So diaspora has a very distinct identity, which is often in conflict with the national capitals of, from the countries they came from. So bearing all that complexity in mind, countries such as the Western Balkan countries are trying now to attract diaspora, but there is still that emotional, psychological uh, distance and cultural distance between diasporas 
and countries of origin. Many local government areas and communities directly benefit from investment uh, from overseas and remittances, but the diaspora doesn't want to be seen as a cash cow. They want to be part of the development story. And this is why I think Italy and Germany are trying to use the word and language of skills transfer um, as an opportunity. But whether that opportunity will be utilized in a positive way or not remains to be seen. Um, Albania, North Macedonia and Serbia are the front runners in this regard, but they are not alone. Um, the Open Balkans is an initiative uh, which is a regional labor migration scheme in the Western Balkans. So it's an, sort of an, not an alternative to the EU membership, but while you're in the waiting zone, this is something that has been encouraged. And of course, it goes with the spirit of uh, good neighborly relations. For Albania, um, Open Balkans is very strongly supported by both the Albanian leader and the Serbian leader in this case, using those countries as case studies. Um, and it was interesting to watch a video made by um, Albania's uh, minister for diaspora. He went to the Kennedy School of the Harvard University and he made this wonderful presentation of how they are trying to engage um, numerous Albanian diaspora abroad. Actually, more than 1.4 Albanians live overseas out of a country with 2.8 million people. So similar situation perhaps to Malta, which has, I think, in Australia, the largest diaspora um, something like 350,000 people. So attracting that um, finance, skills, and people remains a big challenge, but this is a new movement and a lot of research will be done in the next couple of years on um, this sub-regional issue. Serbia has a similar story. Um, it was actually looking at Poland in its recent legislative changes. So now anybody as of last week who is um, who has lineage to the Serbian whether through one parent or both parents or grandparents, um, ethnicity can go into the process of seeking citizenship. So this is a very new development. And the government of Serbia said they, they looked at the Polish example as, um, as their um, role model in this case. But Germany's federal employment agency is actually sponsoring very actively returning experts programs. Linguistic diversity is not easy in this case. So often English is used as lingua franca um, for um, the skills um, transfer. However, um, it, that language does complicate things because diaspora often doesn't actually speak well the local language from um, the countries they come from and they don't read, they don't write. And that again, poses another level of complexity. There are many schools in the Western Balkans which are trying to offer online training for children now, which is quite interesting. It's never existed before. So the Zooming life has been quite useful for children. And again, this is part of the story to influence diaspora, to enable them uh, with language skills to come back. What I found is an uncomfortable truth was very interesting. So Serbia had very um, large environmental protests, which actually led eventually to the Rio Tinto $450 million project to be canceled. However, the main activist came from Melbourne. She was a famous Australian um, Serbian um, actress and she was one of the leading voices behind this movement. Now, this diaspora collect connection is an uncomfortable truth for the local governments in the Western Balkans. Diaspora is coming back with their own political ideas, with um, ideas how to change the status quo. And this is seeing, being seen as a challenge by the local governments and local communities. So there is no uh, synergy as yet in quite a few areas of this space. And this could create tensions in the future. The labor market landscape has certainly changed in the, in the Western Balkans. So I find it very interesting that the Western Balkan governments are now signing labor agreements with Bangladesh, Guatemala, uh, Vietnam, um, Nepal, Turkey, Uzbekistan. I mean, Guatemala for me is the most fascinating uh, case. Obviously, there has never been um, any sort of close connection between Guatemala and the Western Balkan countries. Whether they will be... Um, in the future, wanting to stay some of these migrants, uh, this would bring the same question as Germany had in the 70s or in the 80s, uh, which Australia is having now. How do, you, how do you incorporate these migrants if they wish to stay, if they uh, find a pathway to stay? So this is going to be a new 
question for this region, a completely new question. Um, there is a so-called construction worker diplomacy that some countries are being potentially criticized for, um, especially regarding China. China has been the most um, important foreign actor in the economic space and labor market space in the Balkans over the past five years. They are bringing their own contingents of workers, many of them of questionable origin, whether they're from detainees or nobody really knows. And um, the Balkan governments usually make an agreement with the Chinese company that wins the tender um, and they bring their own labor force. And there is no opposition to this generally in the Balkans because the governments are supporting that project. Um, many questions about workers' exploitation, human rights, and we are talking about massive projects. One of them in Croatia was 85% of it was financed by the European Commission, causing a lot of issues um, because of that. For, foreign employment agencies are usually used as intermediaries, um, but the mechanisms for oversight of these overseas worker and labor exploitations are, ve are very weak. And in my opinion, the EU role needs to be strengthened and there is no time to wait as Jean Monnet said they have to act now um, by increasing local capacities to recognize first of all the problem to spread awareness of many of these problems and to campaign for better conditions for all of these workers thank you very much any questions um, and also yes I have a not too active Twitter account but somewhat active and um, Yes, I can also receive questions by email. Thank you. Are there any questions from the floor? Well, I'm at Sarah, um, and uh, you did mention, and uh, this is obviously a serious problem that you raised about human trafficking, uh, organized crime, and whether the EU's regulatory measures are good, you know, Within EU member countries, whether the EU perhaps is, should be doing more in terms of helping candidate countries. Yeah. I've, got, I've got another part of the question, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> because I know the EU is focused, as you know, on things like terrorism, counting terrorist finance through the FATF money bail and so on. So the EU is focused on making money. Terrorist financing, but not so much on organized crime and not so much on, on human trafficking. So that's our candidate countries, and are they undertaking efforts against this themselves, and, and are they sufficient? Do they need more EU help to do this? Thing? The second thing I wondered about, but I don't know the answer is we see a number of Chinese diasporas working in Belt and Road projects in parts of Eastern Europe, but also near um, or in Monash's own campus in Barclay and Italy is the biggest Chinese population working in manufacturing predominantly. Um, I know what the situation is in Italy, but what kinds of clients Chinese imported workers, for example, be getting in service? Thank you. The first question is very simple. Uh, the EU is absolutely complicit. Um, countries such as Croatia, where my friend was working and I, I was interviewing him for a project, um, often the children will be classified as 16, doesn't matter if they were 10, 12, 13, because they will be shifted to Germany. So if a child is under 16, an EU member state has a responsibility to provide adequate care. But if you classify the child as 16, you send them off to Germany without worrying about that child anymore. So the EU member states themselves are absolutely complicit in this uh, horrible problem. Of course, candidates countries um, need more capacity and more practical training. It's not enough, again, um, how, how many billions have we given to Papua New Guinea over the past 50 years and uh, the capacities haven't been strengthened in most areas. At the same time, just throwing money at the local governments does not solve the problem. You really need bottom-up approaches and uh, strengthening that training and practical part on the ground to recognize uh, both that there is a problem with workers' exploitation, human trafficking, and so on. When it comes to Chinese diaspora in the Balkans, actually, diaspora is quite old in modern sense. Uh, over In the 1990s, the Chinese government was actually giving $10,000 per Chinese citizen who would 
go to Europe and establish a business as long as they don't go back. And many of these uh, Chinese diaspora members were actually stationed in countries like Serbia, over 45,000 in one at one point and they were actually helping serbia during the sanctions because when you have sanctions you can't really import and export most things whereas the chinese diaspora businesses really um maintained this regional economic um sort of activity when it comes to the exploitation of workers rights what is interesting if, if you look at the regional commentary and press those um articles are quickly cut the language in those articles is not critical enough. And you can feel that there is a pressure on the journalists not to be critical. Um, even the way they report is, is, is half-hearted. They can't. And this is the problem, that reporting this, this issue is almost um, self-sabotaged. So the assistance so, to free press. So, so Chinese guest workers in, in Serbia, for example? In the whole, yes, in, in, in the whole of Balkans, yeah. yeah. So, so in the in the whole of the Balkans, uh, have different rights in terms of labour rights. From in terms of uh, legally, they're um, legally, yeah. well, they fall under the Chinese government um, oh, body. Chinese yes, government. so they labor. come with a project, and the project is co-financed by China, and they live in the camps of their own. So they they have no connection or no right. mixing with anything that's local. There's effectively no jurisdiction. Local jurisdiction. If there was, let's say, a murder, I'm yeah, sure course, there would yeah. be. In terms of labour rights, there's no. There is uh, there is a pretense that there is equality in labour rights, but of course there isn't. Um, and in Croatia, this this was a bit more freely talked about. Mm. Uh, but in across the Balkans, Chinese projects are blossoming. There are many construction projects, um, um, energy projects, and each one of them brings along a contingent of of the workers. What's, what, what, what are attitudes predominantly towards uh, guest workers from the People's Republic of China? What there is no mixing at all. So there is no physical mixing between is the there local opposition population. to not at all. Of there is not because the governments are supporting it. So these are government sponsored projects. So if you have support of the president or the prime minister, um, there is absolutely no connection there, but no opposition uh, as we witnessed in other parts of the world like um, Latin America. I thought what you were saying about children was really interesting and the underreporting of that. Is there is there anyone other than journalists who've written about this? I don't know. I mean, this is only what I've gathered from my own interviews with uh, individuals working in this area. Um, I would not know that answer. But he did present at our conference at East Sands last year. Yeah, yes, of course. Let's turn on my microphone. I wonder if I can invite you to comment a bit more on the role of um, religion and the politics of immigration in the Balkans, because in many ways, um, religion has played a fairly important role during the Balkan Wars in the 1990s. And of course, uh, historically, this was an era which was uh, for centuries under the control of the Ottoman Empire. Um, might that be one of the reasons why um, public opinion has shifted fairly decisively against uh, immigration, especially from the Middle East? And is that also a factor um, with respect to uh, these um, um, labor migration agreements that you mentioned with um, various non-European countries? I think definitely religion plays a part, even though Turkey is a, one of the most important players in this part of the world, Turkey sponsors the construction of new mosques, uh, education, they give a lot of scholarships to people in the Western Balkans. So Turkey is a major factor in terms of um, foreign actor, um, including in the religious space. However, this new migration, especially this year, is mostly from Pakistan and Afghanistan, much more than Syria and Iraq, um, is causing a lot of intra um, group tensions within the migrant camps. There was actually a shooting a few days ago. And that is causing anxiety in the local communities. The actual, again, that securitization, but when it comes to the local level, I think that could be more explosive because when locals start protesting and potentially like in Bosnia, the camps was burned to the ground, that is when the tension could increase. So I personally wouldn't say it is religiously motivated at all. Um, it because a lot of 
the areas, including in the Muslim areas of Bosnia, there is opposition to these new migrants. So it is a regional problem um, that is being exacerbated by um, absolute lack of economic development locally. So migrants are seen as a threat, not as an opportunity. And nobody wants migrants to stay. Um, being from sort of foreign countries, far away foreign Muslim countries um, is another problem. But there was also a case of um, former ISIS uh, members um, who have registered on this route conducted, conducting bombings in, um, in the West. So that image also doesn't help local anxieties as well, even though we're talking about a very small number of, of people who have conducted these um, terrorist attacks, the anxieties are amalgamated with that. So, yeah. Uh, the former ambassador to Malta. Former deputy, yeah. High Commissioner. Sorry, I just promoted you accidentally. <laughs> Could I, could I ask you to please uh, press the button on the microphone? Thank you very much. Sorry. Is it all right now? Thank you. I just would like to add something on the migration because it's so vast and it's always uh, tailored from country to country. So when I was posted as a consul of a new member state in Egypt, uh, we were all quite worried because at the time the population of Egypt was increasing by 1.6 million per year. Now it's more. Now it's over 2 million. Suffice to say that uh, from 2006, 2007, when the population was 80 million, now Egypt has surpassed 100 million. We do have migrants, a regular migration from Egypt, but a good thing and this is where the EU could have done and could still do something, that the Egyptian government cooperates a lot and repatriates illegal migrants from Egypt. When I was there, I was doing a diploma at the American University of Cairo, and it was on public relations. And I did my the question of my thesis to see if it was propitious for migrants to try to return, especially because in Egypt it's very rare, you have a phenomenon where migrants always tend to return back. From what I had uh, discovered, basically very few make it. I cannot give you statistics whether it was one in a hundred or one in a thousand, but basically the sacrifices that they do, they have lands, they would have to sell them or get a bank loan because they would give the human trafficker at least 4,000 US dollars. But then at the end of it, they're much worse off. The vast majority, they are much worse off than when they started because even when they make it to, to the European capitals, their jobs would be limited to odd jobs in constructions. Sometimes they are not paid. Living in abysmal conditions where the standard of living is worse than it was in their village. Now, in this case, it seemed that, and I had proposed it, what the EU could have done is a promotion campaign where it shows that illegal immigration when it's done in that way, it's not in their interest at all. And like this, you are at least mitigating, at least from similar-minded countries, irregular migration. I did have interviews um, uh, the other um, esteemed scholar was asking about sources. I did interviews with the police consortium there, sponsored by seven countries. And, uh, of course, many other EU consuls. So I think that sometimes a campaign, a PR campaign, showing that it's not propitious to migrate in the first place because you end up worst off, could be implemented as a, a, an effective functional tool to mitigate the migration phenomenon. 
Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I think Australia would be able to um, help the European Union uh, officials on that with its um, campaigns in Indonesia, but how effective they were um, is under a veil of secrecy because the previous government did not allow for regular report, uh, reports to be given to the journalists. So the, Australia has tried that approach in Indonesia before. And, and it, said, it said the EU doesn't, but has more funding for sure. The EU is more complicated. They should definitely think that, about that it. For sure, because if I, I don't want to take much time, because when I discussed it, I was there discussing it. The problem is that you have to convince a lot of quant countries, and then even if they convince their government, then their government could change within six months. <laughs> so any action within the EU, it's... Um, it takes a very, 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 very long time, unfortunately. That's why Jean Monet said, be patient. Thank, thank you. Thanks very much for that. On the conscious of the time, I'd like to thank um, Pedro again and also, of course, Nina for her great paper as well. And uh, Nina, great for many things that we've still got. Thank you.